welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. So I'm thrilled to announce today's guest. Our guest for today is Sunny Whitcock. She's a lecturer here at the University in English. And she's also a PhD candidate from Harvard in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. She's going to be talking a little bit about Yiddish and a little bit about her project. And we've got these beautiful Yiddish books. Can I say Yiddish a bit here? Mm-hmm. Yiddish a bit here. Their book. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Sunny Yukov today. Thieves honed their trade in. 
It was a language that businessmen traded in, that actors performed in, that modernist poets experimented in. Simply put, it was a language in which people lived. And this lets me turn my attention to the topic at hand. It was language in which people, including many writers, experienced illness and inserted themselves into public health discourse. At the turn of the 20th century, one of the diseases that moved largest in the landscape of health discourse was tuberculosis, specifically pulmonary tuberculosis. Here is where my research begins, and here, if you're squeamish, I'd encourage you to eat fast, <laughs> because I'm going to talk about disease and phlegm and the like. So let me begin with the explosive poetic address of the Yiddish poet Luna Mates, whose last name, meaning pale, bespoke his own tubercular complexion. This is number two on the handout. I lift up my poem in song to you, Colorado, my Colorado. The poem is filled with my with Lithuanian bombast. It was published in 1923, and the line is drawn from the 15 part free verse poem by Luna Matas to the Rocky Mountain landscape entitled Colorado. Matas arrived in Denver in 1918. Five years earlier, he had immigrated from Poland. He had done work here in Chicago as a cigar maker, but in Denver is where he found his poetic voice, published his first, vol first volume of poetry, and saw his work translated into English. But how did this aspiring poet end up in Denver, and how was his career fostered there? Like his fellow Yiddish poets, Yehoash and H. Leibach, the African-American writer Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and the socialite Constantine Pulitzer, Matas arrived in Denver not to speculate on gold, but on his health. By the mid-1800s, Colorado had become a prime destination for those seeking respite for their ailing lungs. In the, they sought this respite in what was considered the climatologically uh, approved uh, zone of the cool, dry, high mountain air. In the words of one so-called Lunger, Colorado was a medical El Dorado. In the words of another, it was the Western Davos. In other words, Denver as a place of therapeutic possibility loomed large in the American consciousness, and so too in the American Yiddish press. For example, one community leader wrote in the Yiddish press that Denver was not the Western El Dorado, nor the Western Davos, but rather the Western Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, a Western health seeker's paradise. Matis began to show signs of TB while working in Chicago. And after a brief stint in the local sanatorium, he was admitted in 1918 to the Jewish Consumptives Relief Society, the JCRS, which was a sanatorium founded in Denver in 1903 under the auspices of Dr. Charles Spivak. Its goal was to service indigent Jewish tuberculars who were arriving penniless by the day in Denver, unable to pay for treatment or for basic shelter. Most importantly for the historian of literature, the JCRS sustained a thriving literary <coughs> culture supporting writers, professional and amateur, growing literary reputations, nurturing experimentation, and becoming known in Spivak's own words as, quote, a fountain of poetry. And what I want to do today is to investigate the Yiddish literary history through the prism of TV and one of its most prominent institutions, the JCRS. Following these introductory remarks, I'll attend to the careers of three affiliates of the JCRS, Leon Cobrin, Yehoash, and the aforementioned Luna Mata. I listed their name and um, the names of other figures who will feature in my lecture on the handout. And I will ask how affiliation offered them new opportunities to increase their literary capital, as well as to offer them national exposure, new publishing venues, new languages, and literary connections. And with this project, I enter into a very long conversation between the fields of literature and disease, literature and medicine, specifically between writing and tuberculosis. At the end of the 19th century, the turn of the 20th, tuberculosis was rampant. Many writers, from Keats to Chekhov to Kafka, suffer from the so-called wasting disease. There emerged around them a medico-romantic understanding of the disease, which was explained <coughs> as late as 1940 by the historian Lewis Mormon in his study, Tuberculosis and Genius. Inescapable physical activity, he wrote, begets mental activity, end quote. He summarized the view that a feverish state compelled equally feverish bursts of creativity. And now after the historians Renee and John Dufault, as well as theoretician uh, Susan Sontag, it's no longer tenable to assert this romantic equation, yet it pops up again and again. The question remains, why does it seem that sick writers were so productive? <coughs> I'd like to reframe this question. I ask not how tuberculosis physiologically induced creativity, not whether the tuberculosis poet should indeed be figured as a romantic hero, but I investigate to how tuberculosis came to mediate the success of these writers. 
how to determine the literary paths of both themselves and their writing. I want to investigate how TV, and by extension the institution erected to combat it, the JCRS, came to occupy various points uh, in their, what I'm calling their bio-literary network. That is to say, how new opportunities accrued to them to build their oeuvre, to increase their literary capital, to grow their legacies, even to construct a tubercular Yiddish tradition. And while my language is informed by Bruno Latour and Pierre Bourdieu, I'll leave my methodological concerns aside today. And rather, what I want to show, without minimizing at all the devastation of the physiology of tuberculosis, is that a diagnosis of TB or a stint at the JCRS did not stymie the careers of these tubercular Yiddish writers, but rather precisely the opposite. It implicated them in a bilinary network that crisscrossed the country and that affected the JCRS tubercular patients and non tubercular writers alike. So let me turn to my first case, that of Leon Colbert. Perhaps now turn to a I'm going to start by talking about a writer who was neither tubercular nor ever a resident of Denver. Leon Colbert immigrated to New York from what is now Belarus in 1892. He soon made his name as a Yiddish playwright, as a translator of Russian drama into Yiddish, and as the first playwright to adapt Shakespeare's Othello into colloquial American Yiddish, filled with such classic Yiddish phrases as all right and for sure. His own work, however, would not be translated into English until it was solicited by the JCRS. To explain, the Denver Sanatorium was funded by charity and almost exclusively by donations, many of which were no more than 50 cents. The names of these donors were then printed in the JCRS in-house bilingual journal. Its primary fundraising mechanism and the journal is called the Sanatorium, the Sanatorium. Such bilingual Yiddish-English journals were rare at the time and would never really catch on. But the officers of the JCRS knew that in order to raise funds, they had to have the broadest appeal possible. What was a fundraising necessity then fostered a bilingual literary space. It offered Yiddish writers what was often their first chance to see their work appear both in English and in Yiddish. Such was the case, for example, with the Yiddish playwright Ian Coburn. In 1908, the editor of the journal commissioned Coburn to write for them. He agreed, and the product was the one-act play entitled The Rescue, The Ratum. The play tells a story of the tubercular Jewish immigrant, Morris Gutmann. His family is willing to go to extremes in order to send him to Colorado to take a cure. The play's message is blunt. Donate money, or else the wife of the aptly named Gutmann will be forced to prostitute herself. Most importantly, this was Coburn's first piece to be translated into English. Now, through the impetus of the JCRS, Coburn could reach English readers. And to be clear, this was no small audience. The journal boasted 12,000 subscribers and appealed to advertisers, claiming 75,000 readers. In subsequent volumes, the editors mentioned that the famous playwright Colburn had published in the journal and attest to the worthiness of their cause by this name dropping. And indeed, this name dropping became a common technique in the journal for fundraising. Most interesting for historians of literature is this co-articulation of sanatorium and Yiddish literature. Colburn, with a text that thematized the mission of the sanatorium, was given an opportunity to reach an English audience. The JCRS, in turn, garnered prestige by association with the beloved writer and published a text with clear fundraising goals. And Colburn was not the only writer in, this, in which this dynamic played out. I mentioned that Morris Winchewski, who's primarily known as a Yiddish writer, witnessed one of his own English language texts translated into Yiddish in the JCRS journal. The text is entitled in English, Cranky Old Ike. In Yiddish, the author trained Ike, or the old sick guy, Ike. This also thematized the fundraising mission of the JCRS, and in fact, in translation, became a story about tuberculosis. Finally, I'd offer that Yehoah, the poem I'll speak about uh, shortly, also tested the boundaries between English and Yiddish on the pages of the journal, of which he was the editor of the Yiddish supplement. For example, he published a jocular Yiddish poem called Alitabat Kandidat, which means Alitabateur slash candidate for tuberculosis treatment, under the name Longfellow. <laughs> a pseudonym he printed in English letters next to his Yiddish text, and next to his Yiddish text. Yehovah would later go on to translate Hayawatha in its entirety uh, into Yiddish in a decidedly unfunny version. Now, Yehovah's first attempts at English poetry also appeared in the journal, <coughs> such as the 1907 White Plague, which is number three on your handout. And I'll read it in full. Humanity is changing color as it goes. Its onward march, so are the miseries and woes. Of yore, the fatal war scourge with the terror red, that like a bloody blade, blade hung o'er the nation's head. 
Black epidemics swept and thinned the human race, turning whole continents in one huge burial place. Now fate, unsated still, is on our heels once more, but not in robes of night or crimson garb of yore. This greatest of all human sufferings we call white plague, the blackest, fiercest of them all, and silently, all silently it gathers in its harvest dread, and killing it flies along, creates its living death. The poem presents the white plague as an imperialist threat that steadily conquers new territory and that will obviously not be confined to Colorado. The poem also offers insights into Yehawash's developing English language poetic voice. Here, his skills appear amateurish. The figure figure to feel is heavy handed, black, red, white, the meter is forced, the six line terms of a awkward proposition, and the lofty diction is repetitive to no clear rhetorical rhetoric head. <coughs> why you're twice in lines three and eight. I read this is a product of a poet not yet comfortable in English. And the poem had in fact appeared two years earlier in the Colorado Medical Journal, following an article about the dedication of new tents at the JCRS. So if the poem were not his finest, why do you publish it? An answer may be found when we examine the journal edition as a whole. For in addition to the White Plague, this not March 1907 edition published The Climate Worshipper by the Denver-based cowboy poet James Barton Adams. The text was a peon to climatological therapy. The speaker describes his family health, family's health as follows in number four. Scarcely looking like human beings, more like skeletons we were, like the half with consumption that was catching hold of her. And the youngin woke a coffin, me a worrying so well, got discouraged till I wasn't worth a pinch of salt and hell. Written in the dialect of a rancher, purposely riddled with misspellings and frequently making use of a low linguistic register, Barton's body poem now stands in stark contrast to the staid and now evidently polished effort of the white plague. Yehoash's poem is insistently grammatically correct. The diction is sophisticated, no accent is perceptible, nor any regional or ethnic locution. Yehoash's technique, albeit flawed, allows him to pass as an English writer of a high register. And his style bespeaks his own Yiddish literary aspirations, which are brought into stark relief in this network of textual relations in the sanatorium. So now that I've briefly introduced Yehoash, let me turn to his case more thoroughly. Yehoash is perhaps best known as the most famous, uh, he's probably the most known as the Yiddish translator of the entirety of the Hebrew Bible. He arrived in Denver in 1899, in his words, more dead than alive. He had immigrated to New York in about a decade, decade earlier from what is now Lithuania, and he had then contracted tuberculosis. He arrived in Denver as an aspiring poet. Though never a formally a patient at the JCRS, he became affiliated with the institution soon after its founding and most likely sought informal treatment there. He also served as the head of the JCRS Committee on Press and Propaganda. He was the editor of the Yiddish section of the in-house journal, and it was he who solicited Yiddish writers to contribute to bilingual publication. Perhaps most interesting for my purposes today, Yehoash was a field solicitor for the JCRS. He traveled on behalf of the institution to raise money for it. Now recall in the poem, White Plague, that I just read, he writes how the disease, quote, all silently it gathers in its harvest dread, and killing inch by long, parades its living dead. <coughs> Indeed, he was one such tubercular on parade, or better yet, on a fundraising mission. In 1908, despite his health, Yehoash left Denver on a fundraising tour. And over the course of a year, Yehoash performed poetry readings throughout the Northeast and Midwest, stopping in New York, Boston, Cincinnati, and Chicago, to name a few. Large crowds attended these performances, which were heavily advertised in the Yiddish press. The tour resulted in return to the JCRS to the tune of $10,000. His readings were also heralded by the JCRS Journal as an advertisement for American Yiddish poetry in general. Here's what the editors of the JCRS Journal have to say. Quote, While Yehoash's tour was intended as propaganda for the JCRS, his presence in the East has at the same time stimulated the cultivation of Jewish poetry. Thousands of our American co-religionists who had no idea of the literary possibilities of Yiddish had a startling revelation. So more than a financial success for the sanatorium, or a cultural success on behalf of the nascent Yiddish literary tradition, Yehoash also met with what the JCRS officers described as hero worship. His fellow writer and field solicitor Jacob Marinoff relayed the same sentiment in a letter to Yehoash's wife, where he wrote that when Yehoash got up on stage, quote, everyone in the vast audience rose to their feet and cheered, 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 and cheered again. The theater shakes, the stage cracks, and Yehoash deeply moves, bows again, and bears up like a hero. <laughs> 
Marimoth's words are also a signal to the historian of Yiddish literature. They offer a glimpse into Yahawash's performance where we find not only a field agent on assignment, but a writer on a publicity tour. This was in fact Yahawash's first reading tour, his first chance to perform a selection from his first volume of poetry. So just as we find advertisements identifying Yahawash as his world famous poet, we also find promotional material introducing the poet who is presumably unknown. Yahawash was, and certainly, was certainly not obscure. After all, he was headlighting the fundraising uh, tour. But the tour afforded him national exposure and literary capital that had heretofore been unavailable to him. For the first time, we find poems published in his honor, his poems sent to music, his legacy publicly acknowledged. Here, the bioliterary network of American Yiddish writing passes through a complex note in which the JCRS finances, Yahawash's reputation, and the reputation of Yiddish literature in general are all implicated. What was ostensibly a fundraising tour functioned as the occasion for Yahawash's national exposure and increased public support for Yiddish cultural expression. Now I want to turn my attention to my final case, and away from the likes of Kobe and Yahawash, who although not well known necessarily at the, at the time, they've cemented their reputations as canonical Yiddish writers. But the JCRS supported many amateur writers as well, who were remaining virtually unknown. This included Una Matas, author of The Ode to Colorado with which I began. Unlike Yehawash, Matas's name has long been lost to Yiddish literary studies. After today, I can claim that at least 30 more people in the world uh, know his name. <laughs> um, his was a short poetic career bounded first physically and then aesthetically by the JCRS, in which he was treated in two stints, the first in, uh, between 1918 and 1923. His chosen style was free verse, and his influences ranged from Whitman to Pound to his fellow Yiddish tuberculars like Yehawash. His experiences also modeled that of a poet supported by the JCRS. For example, his work was first translated into English in 1923 in the pages of Haptikva, a JCRS publication. And if you're interested, I brought three examples, um, and you can't get sick by touching them, which is a question I often get, so they are up here <laughs> as well. <laughs> Academia is filled with hypochondriacs. <laughs> of his first volume, which was called Open Portals, Open a Toilet, Matas also drew on the institution's personnel to advertise his recent work. Charles Spivak, the officer of the JCRS, sent a copy of the text to the modernist Yiddish poet Zishalanda with a letter praising Matas as a lovable man who, quote, while regaining his health, discovered that he must give vent to his feelings in rhyme, end quote. In the self-declared role as a publicity man, Spivak recounted Matas's miraculous trajectory from someone who went from someone who could barely spell correctly in Yiddish to quote, and who was crude in ways of expressing his thoughts, to the talented author of a collection of poetry. Spivak added, quote, it is not out of place to mention the fact that one of our founders of the JCRS is a poet. I refer to the fact that Mr. Yahawash wrote his first volume of poems while resident of Denver. For publicity purposes, we didn't mention on passant that it seems that the JCRS is a fountain of poetry. In order to promote Matas, Spivak invokes the literary lineage of the JCRS and Yehoash. Spivak then repeated this story of Matas's rise to Hillel Rogoff, an editor of the Yiddish Daily Sower. And he explained to Rogoff that his interest in Matas lies not in the fact that he's a poet, but that he's, quote, a product of the JCRS. Spivak concludes by asking Rogoff to publish a photograph of a banquet held in Matas's honor at the sanatorium. Now, despite Spivak's efforts, this photograph didn't appear. But his efforts reiterate the narrative that Matas was a poet reared in the JCRS, supported by its leader and its literary gestalt. Matas himself described the wonder of the JCRS, which encouraged its patients to spend their time reading. The institution's library where Matas would work had hundreds of volumes in multiple languages. In Matas' own experiences, reading was prohibited at sanatoria uh, in order to, as a hindrance to recuperation. And I could talk about that after this. The JCRS, in contrast, encouraged patients to immerse themselves in world literature. More than a space of reading, the JCRS also functioned as a workshop. It literally gave Matas pen and paper, as well as books and newspapers to read. And there, Matas would write his first volume of poetry. It was also in that library that Matas would depoet his volume of poetry. And 10 years after he left the JCRS, when his books still remained in active circulation, we find attestation from Shia Tenenbaum, who's a prolific memoirist, that, quote, he got to know El Matas after he found his work in the JCRS library. He also called him the court poet of the sanatorium, and he lovingly recounted that same banquet, uh, the picture of which Spivak had wanted Rogoff to publish. 
So Bill Rogoff ignored Spivak's letter, the banquet became part of JCRS institutional memory. Mer uh, Against this background, I'm going to conclude by just approaching Matis's program, because it's worth it, it's great, and so few people know it, and asked how tuberculosis constituted his literary output and mediated his reputation. Writing about the dependence of Proust's literary style on his asthma, Walter Benjamin, Walter Benjamin, all the accents, conclude that the physiology of style, quote, would take us into the innermost core of Proust's creativeness, end quote. I propose a modified conclusion for Matis's work. A physiology of subject would take us into his innermost core of creativeness. Unlike that of Proust, Matis's syntax does not, quote, rhythmically and step by step reproduce his fear of suffering. That's what Walter Benjamin claims about Proust. A fear that would have been likely shared by somatics and tuberculars alike. And to be sure, one may be tempted to read Matis's with Manian verbosity as evidence of his desire to talk his way out of death. Alternatively, one may be tempted to interpret his 1926 collection, Momentum, Moments, in light of his disease. This collection includes poems of two to five lines, their tone and length derivative of pound. But these images, imagistic verses seem to be the output of a poet unable to catch his breath. But Matis's oeuvre is stylistically inconsistent. What is consistent, and I would argue overdetermined, is his subject. His writing is saturated by tuberculosis. His poem, I Am Young and Old, the first person speaker, is a 25-year-old invalid confined to a bed in a sanatorium or monastery. Worms burrow it holes in his lung, and he asks of God, quote, shall I sing from my bloody phlegm a song of praise to you? Matas' volume of 1928, appropriately called The White Prince of the White Plague, contains only five-line poems, such as the first person, I Am Well, and that's number five on your handout. And I am well, and I am well, naked lies my heart and blood, the flowing pen drinks and sings, blood, my blood, my red ink. The speaker's blood becomes his ink, and he drains himself in the creative act. Matas's poetic style may not be symptomatic of his disease, as Benjamin claims Proust's writing to be in relation to his asthma. Yet I am well suggests that Matas's disease fuels his creative process. It is the bloody ink of his tuberculosis pen. If I had come the closest in my elaboration of Matas of describing a poet in typically romantic terms, it was volitional. For his writing does assume certain affinities with the idea of a suffering, wasting artist propelled forth by his disease. But let me complicate this by saying, what, by addressing what his reviewers have to say. For example, one reviewer of his first volume complained that Matas's poetry, quote, too often repeats such words as blood, sputum, phlegm, and cough and that ultimately the poet had not reached his potential. Rather, he was stuck, quote, in his own little world, Velcro, of the sanatorium. Put differently, his recourse to the poeticization of his experience was considered a limiting factor in his artistic growth. Now, in a different paper, I would argue that Matas is, in fact, a sophisticated and elegant poet. But if we take his critics seriously, we have to recognize the tension. On one hand, I'm arguing that his relationship with TV actually propelled his writing. Uh, for the JCRS provided him with promotional support, opportunities for translation, access to books, even pen and paper. On the other hand, his life was bounded by the institution. He was stuck in the little veltel of the sanatorium and could not move beyond its thematic walls. Yet here is where a literary historical approach to the relationship between the poet and the disease may be most productive. Here we see just how Matis' reception and development was conditioned by tuberculosis. It was both that which restricted him and that which gave him opportunities both that which augmented and delimited his literary capital and prestige. At the risk of too brief a conclusion, let me say that what I've tried to do today and with my research is to rethink the relationship between the diagnosis of tuberculosis and literary creativity. It's not a question of physiologically induced creativity, but I've identified the bioliterary network where a variety of interests and literary possibilities meet. Today, the network has crossed through the JCRS, finding Yiddish dramatists seeing their work translated, Yiddish poets writing in English, Yiddish poets as fundraiser, and Yiddish poets as proof positive that a sanatorium can foster literary production. And now, much of, much of my focus today has been historical in scope, but I hope that the brief tidbits of Yiddish poetry that I've read have garnered your interest. And thanks to the efforts begun by the JCRS, many of these Yiddish writers are now available and legible to an English language audience. So as I began with the words of Newman Matzett, let me now conclude with them as well. These are the last five lines of that 15 part of Colorado with which I began. And I'm going to read these in English. This is number six on your page. When I was in the middle of the day, I was in the middle of the day, and I was in the middle of the day, and I was in the middle of the day, and I was in the middle of the day, 
Und dann schloss sich, was hat den Tag mit Gläubigen angezogen? Und den Bau mit Gläubigen kam, kam, was hat deine Schamme angefühlt? The history of Bruno Marquez and of the affiliates of the JCRS is a complicated story of congested, mediated, and medicalized inspiration of Italian verse in English, in Yiddish, in New York, and in Denver, all the while supported by a network of advocates and an institution dedicated to both the physical recuperation of the tubercular and Yiddish literary production. listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts.
Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.